going to move forward, we're going to talk about the most common cancer in the United States, which is skin cancer. And to help us do that, we have Dr. Ali Hendy. Uh, he's a clinical assistant professor of dermatology at Georgetown University Medical Center. He <coughs> it was the, has been the primary investigator on a couple of research uh, projects with implications for melanoma diagnosis and wound healing. Um, he's published more than 20 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, including the Atlas of Skin Cancers. Um, and full disclosure, he performed most surgery on me, um, what was it, like three weeks ago now, I guess. So I have a lot of confidence in him, uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing your presentation. But Linda, you should tell him that you're not done yet. So I'm Yes, just, right. Okay. They know that already, maybe. That, yeah, okay. I sort of mentioned this the, okay. the first night. And also, um, Dr. Hendy did the initial surgery, which removed the cancer. That left what the doctors like to refer to as a defect. Um, the defect was repaired by a separate oculoplastic surgeon who as I may have said, is in the middle of this two-stage reconstructive process. So this is part one, and in a couple weeks I'll have another surgery, and I'll come out with some stitches, but looking a little more like I used to. Not totally, but a little more. Yeah, so, yeah thank you. <laughs> it's a very supportive group. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. I had to rush to get here. I'm sorry if I'm a few minutes late. And I heard you guys had your own bout of excitement, so let's make it a little less exciting for the rest of at least the next hour or so. All right, so I'm going to touch on, um, in very basic terms, just the overview of skin cancer, and then I'll go over the, the updates. Some of it might be um, new to you, and some of it may, you may know well about if you do a lot of health reporting, which I suspect, does everyone do health care reporting? Yeah, yeah, everybody in here has a pretty good background in health okay. reporting. All right. So yeah, you... You can skim through the, the basics. The basics, yeah, yeah. So as you may know, skin cancer is the most common cancer in the United States. Um, it's estimated that one in five Americans will develop skin cancer in their lifetime. So if you're sitting around, you can look around you, look across from you, you know, pick five people, one, <laughs> one out of those five will get skin cancer. Um, <laughs> no, I did. Those I'm are good. Yeah. There's more than. Oh, okay. One, two, three, four. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, and uh, more than 20 Americans die each day from skin cancer, and most of those deaths are from melanoma. Melanoma accounts for only a minority of the total skin cancer burden, but it accounts for the majority of the skin cancer deaths uh, overall. So, what is skin cancer? Just like any other cancer, skin cancer is a a malignant condition where um, benign cells grow uncontrollably, which is a definition of a cancer. Normally cells have what's called contact inhibition, so when they touch each other, they know to stop growing. Cancer cells lose that contact inhibition, so they keep growing and multiplying. Um, there's two broad categories of skin cancers and, um, in, in the dermatology world. They're referred to as melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers. Um, the non-melanoma skin cancers, uh, we'll go into a little, little detail here and uh, as, as we will with melanoma. Both are related to damage of the DNA, just like any other cancer. In this case, the damage in the DNA is often caused by UV radiation. That UV radiation could be from the sun or tanning devices. Um, melanoma, as the name would uh, imply, starts from what's called melanocytes. Those are the pigment cells in our skin. And non-melanoma skin cancers arise from keratinocytes, which is uh, right above the melanocyte layer, the, the, the top layer of the skin. So we touched on UV rays. Um, the World Health Organization, within the last, I want to say, three or four years, labeled UV radiation, even from tanning beds or the sun, as a known carcinogen. We've known this, but they kind of added that oomph to it that it is a carcinogen. We're not just, you know, playing with words or uh, being overly concerned. And up to 90% of non-melanoma skin cancers are caused by UV exposure. Um, and tanning is, is, is one, of those, um, one of those risk factors. And you'll see in here, the first exposure to tanning beds <coughs> in, in our youth increases their chances of developing melanoma by 75%. That's, that's a big increase for a risk factor that you have total control over. So we can't pick our skin type, we can't pick our parents, the genes that we inherited, but exposure to UV is, is totally controllable. So who's affected by skin cancer? 
Um, and, and what are the risks? So anyone who has a sibling who's had a melanoma has a 50% higher chance of getting melanoma. If you're fair, lightly complected, you have a higher chance. Um, skin of color does protect you, but not completely. So you can get skin cancer, the rates are much lower, but it's often caught at a much later stage. And there's some interesting uh, uh, new studies that point to how in Latinos and African Americans, the mortality rate for a melanoma is much higher because it's caught later. Uh, there's precancers that, um, that you may hear about. Actinic keratoses are one, they lead to squamous cell skin cancers. Uh, dysplastic nevi are a marker for increased risk for melanoma and some can become melanoma, a small fraction of them. This is what actinic keratoses look like. They're small, crusty, um, rough, almost feel like <coughs> sandpaper. So let's, let's get into the, the main types of skin cancer. So um, the non-melanoma skin cancers are the top two, basal cell and squamous cell, and then melanoma at the bottom. You can see what they each look like, but um, just to go back, Basal cells are typically pearly and they're dome-shaped, although they could be flat. These are the most common types. They often have blood vessels in them. Squamous cells often have um, uh, kind of a fleshy look to them. They're raw. And melanomas are often um, dark black, gray, shades of different colors with irregular borders. All right, so with basal cell carcinoma, the most common form of skin cancer affecting uh, one million Americans each year more men than women are affected, but the rate in women is increasing rapidly, and, and the theory is that sun exposure, tanning plays a role in that. So what do you look for? An open sore, a shiny bump, reddish patch? These are all different variations of what, um, what the basal cell can look like. Anything from a sore to a, to a scar-like lesion. So it can be hard to self-diagnose, despite how many hours you spend on, on the net looking for pictures, <laughs> which I know nobody does. No. <laughs> All right, squamous cell carcinoma, the second most common type, um, affects about 250,000 people. Um, anywhere from 2 to 10% do spread. So basal cells classically don't spread. It's exceedingly rare. Squamous cells do have a potential to spread. It's less than a melanoma, but it's still there, to up to 10%. Um, and they cause about 2,500 deaths per year in the U.S., so what do you look for? Something that looks like a wart, wart um, a, a bleeding sore that doesn't completely heal up. Sometimes they have a um, feature of uh, almost like a volcano. That's called a keratoacanthoma. It kind of grows rapidly and ulcerates in the center. All right, moving on to melanoma. This is the most deadly form of skin cancer. Um, there are certain characteristics, characteristics which I'm sure everyone here knows about, the, the A, B, C, D, and the E has been added relatively recently because it does help um, diagnose these earlier. So A is for asymmetrical. If you cut a, put a line down the middle, the left and the right should not match in a melanoma. So in this one, left and right match, or they're symmetrical. In this one, they don't. <clears throat> B is for irregular borders. Again, you can see this on the, on the right. C is for color, multicolored. In my practice, uh, Gray and pink are often the, the most significant colors that I see. Like if you see that shade of gray, it's almost always a melanoma. Diameter, it used to be said that it had to be bigger than a pencil head eraser, but again, new data shows that melanomas do start smaller. A pencil head eraser is six millimeters, but you could actually catch melanomas that are two or three millimeters, so you don't have to wait for it to get that big. And then the E, which has been added relatively recently, is for evolving. So anything that's changing, so if you look at a picture of a mole here, the following year this changed and kind of developed a little little twin, that's suspicious for a melanoma. All right, this is a laundry list of the treatments for skin cancer. There's a lot. Um, surgery is still the main treatment course. There's other options that are sometimes used, and I'll touch on some of those once we get into it. All right, so let's talk about some of the updates. Um, this is the 2014 American Cancer Society stats. They're not out with their 2015 uh, stats, but um, I think they come out towards, they should be coming out with those soon, hopefully. Um, up to 3.5 million non melanoma skin cancers in the U.S. Um, melanoma rates have been increasing for the past 30 years, and about 76,000 new melanomas are diagnosed each year, and 10,000 of those die every year. Now, interestingly, 
the male to female ratio is two to one for these melanoma deaths. What is the lifetime risk of melanoma? If you're Caucasian, it's one in 50. If you're African American, it's one in 1,000. And if you're Hispanic, it's one in 200. So it kind of correlates with your pigmentation. The more pigment you are, the more, have, the more protection you have from the UV rays. Um, I'll touch on this now. In African Americans, in the typical co population, the most common location for melanoma is, for men, it's the trunk. For women, it's the legs. That said, you could get it anywhere, even where the sun doesn't shine. In African Americans, Hispanics, Asians, um, it's often the palms, soles, and the fingernails. Um, when I say fingernails, not the nail itself. If you get a dark streak that arises from where the matrix is, the little half moon, and works its way all the way up. <clears throat> The palms, yeah, yeah. Where you have the least pigment, yeah. Well, how, how does that happen with the palms? The, the good question. So the sun definitely plays a role in melanoma development, but it's not the only factor. Um, and studies show from melanoma, it's not the day-to-day -day exposure of the sun that affects you. It's the episodic, high-intensity sun <coughs> exposure or sunburns, or something similar to a sunburn that affects you. So basal cells are more common in those that are out in the sun every day. Just let's say someone works, you know, and, and sits next to a window every day, get, they get a little bit of sun or driving every day. That's more of a risk factor for a basal cell. For melanoma, it's the person that goes on vacation two times a year and gets a sunburn every year. So those are, you know, just things that could explain why you would get it. But it's rare, as you see, it's one in a thousand, but if you're gonna get it, it's, it's often not always. I'm trying to figure out because my palms are generally like, right. like this, so I, I can't see how the sun, sun explosion would get there. But. Yeah, okay. we don't have a good answer unless you're laying out on the beach with your palms up. Yeah. <laughs> Again, the sun is not the only factor. So I've had patients with melanomas in, in the genital skin. So and 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 they're not nudists, so you can't explain the sun <laughs> as, the, as, the, as the as the only only risk factor. <clears throat> And melanoma is the most common form of uh, cancer overall um, in the 25 to 29 year old population. Um, this is for women specifically. All right, there was a study published by one of my colleagues at a Mayo Clinic back in 2005, but um, it's very relevant because up until recently it was felt that you had to be older to get skin cancer, like in your 50s and 60s and so on. But the study that followed a cohort in Minnesota showed that this incidence in that younger population, the under 40 population, is increasing, um, especially for younger women. And again, the tanning beds and, and sun exposure habits are presumed to play a factor here. All right, there was a CDC report that came out recently, you may have heard about it, about the cost of skin cancer, how it's increasing so rapidly. Um, it's consistent with the epidemic that we have. So there is a large number of skin cancers we're diagnosing them earlier and treating them, um, which in and of itself would, you know, prevent future uh, higher costs because if they're untreated, they're often more dramatic and need more uh, costly care. And there's new advances for advanced melanomas. I should have used better words than that, but there's new options for advanced melanomas that are very expensive. These are patients that have metastatic melanoma. Um, there's nothing that cures them, but there's drugs that are coming out that prolongs their life. Sometimes it's by a few months, um, n often not by more than a year or two, but that those drugs are very expensive in the order of ten to $20,000 a month, so those costs all add up. All right, so what are the most common treatments of skin cancers? We'll talk about just briefly, and I'll tell you what some of the new frontiers are in this arena. Um, let's see. So what is local destruction? This is um, used for very superficial basal cell and squamous cells. Um, you may hear the term scraping. It's literally scraping the, pre the, su the superficial layers of skin off with a device called a curette and burning it. Um, you may hear the term freezing or cryosurgery where liquid nitrogen is used to freeze the area of skin. It scabs up and it peels off. The cure rate is very variable, anywhere from 81 to 96%. Obviously, it's for superficial skin cancers because these modalities don't reach the, the let's say the, even the base of the hair follicle we're talking fractions of a millimeter 
immunotherapy. This was a cream that came out when I was a resident. So this was, um, let's see, like in the early 2000s. Um, Imicumod. It's the, it was the first immunotherapy. It, it activates your own immune cells to kind of attack. Um, it was approved for warts and then found to be effective for uh, some superficial skin cancers. It activates your own immune, immune system. Again, it's effective in very superficial skin cancers, but what we see, because it only treats the top layer of the skin, if there's a skin cancer deeper, it could actually conceal it, and then if it's concealed, it just grows underneath the skin, and by the time it comes to a head, it's much bigger than it would have been otherwise. So it has to be used very carefully, not as effective as everyone was hoping it would be. And then there's the standard surgery. That's the, the most common treatment done for skin cancers. Uh, this is where the tumor is cut out in the shape of a football. That piece of tissue goes to the lab. It takes about a week or so to, for the results to come back. And when it goes to the lab, it's, it's uh, processed and the margins are assessed to see if it's all clear. And the patient gets a report saying the margins are clear or they're not. What the patient often doesn't know, when the pathologist is looking at this tissue, he or she is only looking at 1%, often less than 1% of the actual margin. And the reason for that is that the standard way of processing this tissue is called the bread loafing technique. So if you imagine a bread loaf, they're taking a couple of slices from the ends, a couple from the middle, they're turning it on its side and looking at it. So if they don't see, or if they don't cut an area where there's a little um, tentacle or finger-like projection or the tumor said they would miss it. Um, so an analogy of this is having an attorney looking at a life or death um, document and only reading one out of a thousand pages. Unfortunately, this is the standard way of looking at tissues. Rarely, if the, the dermatologist or surgeon um, request it, they may do more labor-intensive way of evaluating it, but this is what's done majority of times. There is, yeah. So because of this, with this, with standard surgery, the recurrence rate is about 10%, let's say, for basal cells and squamous cells. And because of the way of, you know, because of this, a wider margin needs to be removed to minimize those recurrences, if that makes sense. Because you're not looking at the entire periphery, you're only sampling it. So you have to take more, even when you take more, there's a higher recurrence rate. And that brings me to the most technique, which, which Linda had recently. Um, it's the most accurate surgical treatment for skin cancer because you're at looking at the entire margin. It's not just sampling it. The way the tissue is processed, it's processed <coughs> horizontally. So you're seeing the epidermis, the dermis, and the, the center portion all in one plane. So you could assess the margins before the patient is reconstructed or sutured up. So this is some visual pictures. I had a video, but it was a big file. I couldn't get it to send in an email, and it often glitches up in talks. But this, this, this should help. So the visible tumor is removed, um, and then the tissue is inked and color-coded, and a map is made. Um, so each piece of tissue has a different color, so if you drop it or if it falls, you, you still can keep orientation. This is the lab. This is the machine that cuts the tissue. It's called the cryostat. Um, it's basically a, a freezer and a meat cutter combined. Because to cut tissue, it has to be really, really cold. You'll never think of your bologna. <laughs> or the deli you think. Uh, at the grocery store, the same. So it basically freezes it, and, and then you cut into really thin sections. We're talking like 5 to 10 microns. And then it goes through a staining process, which is this machine. Um, that stains it and you, the cancer cells stain differently, typically. And then you look at it under the microscope, which is what you see here. And can I just tell you that while the machines are doing all that, the patient is sitting in the waiting room, just waiting, right? Right, right. But it's not approved for many types of, I mean, I've had it, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it's for cosmetic purposes as much as anything, so insurers will not cover it for, you know, like defy or something like that all the time. So, in an attempt to cut down costs in healthcare, there has been more limitations recently. Um, that said, like, you know, if it's on your thigh and it's been treated before, they have to pay for it. 
if it's on your thigh and you're under 40, they need to pay for it because you have a long life, you know, line that so it could, you know, come back. There's a lot of time for it to come back. So it's not a, just all a black and white. So the doctor and the physician can have that discussion. Yeah. Does it give you a better cosmetic result? Yes, because it's a smaller hole that's removed. Um, but the main thing is it's a, the lower recurrence. Yeah. Um, and that said, let me preempt it by saying not every skin cancer needs more surgery. So if it's on your thigh and if it's a superficial basal cell, yeah, you're, you could get away with just a scraping technique. Granted, it'll leave you a scar, you know, but any surgery leaves a scar. It's just, yeah. A lot of these discussions are, you know, you can look at it from an individual perspective, like what do I want? I want the highest cure rate. Or a societal perspective. If everyone wants the highest cure rate, is there enough in that pie to go around for everybody or you know what else is not getting funded that's a whole different ethical yeah, dilemma all right and then this is just shows the freezing process the staining process that's actually the picture of dr. Frederick Mose who's passed away so Mose is not an acronym it's the name of a surgeon who came up with the technique in, uh, in Wisconsin University of Madison and then this is what the tissue looks like so this is like a clean section of, of tissue. It's called a, a slide or a, or a cross section. And here, these dark blue cells are basal cells. That's what basal cell looks like under the microscope. And because the tissue is mapped, you know exactly this came from. You put a red ink in that quadrant, and then you go back only to that quadrant, and you only take more from that quadrant as opposed to the whole area. And then you do this until it's clear, and this last one showed a clear margin. So what are the cure rates? We were talking about this earlier. For most, for basal cells and squamous cells, it's like 98 to 99 percent. With standard surgery, which is that bread loafing technique, 90 to 92 percent. With destruction, it's very variable because when you're scraping something and you're freezing it, you could do it lightly, you could do it hard, so it's hard to get really good controlled studies, and those haven't been done recently. But the best data that we have points to the cure rates that are very acceptable. Uh, but again, if this is on an eyelid, you would never freeze a skin cancer on an eyelid because you've damaged the eye and you would never scrape it because you're unlikely to get it all because of the anatomy of the eyelid and the follicles of the, and the sebaceous glands. And then when I say topical, creams like the Imikumod, anywhere from 75 to 85%, only FDA approved for skin can superficial skin cancers below the head and neck. All right, so the benefits, the highest cure rate, the entire margin are evaluated the same day by the surgeon. So the surgeon is the pathologist. So there's no, you know, nothing is lost in translation there. There's fewer recurrences. It leaves the smallest possible surgical defect because you don't have to take a wide margin to hope that you get it all out. You could take the minimal margin and still be able to see if it's clear or not. It's cost effective in the sense that it's outpatient and it only local anesthesia is used for the most portion. Um, and as far as the reconstruction, so in my practice, everything on the eyelid goes to oculoplastic surgeon. But any other location, we do it all in the office, again, under local anesthesia. And because of all these benefits, it is the, one of the fastest growing procedures in medicine. Um, it, it's got universal acceptance as the best uh, treatment for, for a lot of skin cancers. Um, and because of that, it is coming under scrutiny. Um, you know, when it comes to CMS and Medicare and funding and, you know, whenever a procedure takes off and a lot of doctors are using it, what they do, they cut the reimbursement so sure. less doctors use it. So, yeah. But what happens, yeah, we won't go into that because that's a different discussion here. All right, so what are some of the new frontiers in, in, in most surgery and, and skin cancer treatment? So there's something called immunohistochemistry. It's basically a, um, a, a targeted approach to seeing skin cancers or skin cancer cells that you normally couldn't see. Um, the specific markers are applied to the tissue, so the cells actually light up under the microscope. So this improves the accuracy of, of reading slides from melanomas and other rare conditions uh, that I have a personal ex interest in called extra mammary Paget's disease. Normally, if you're looking at the, the, these tissues under regular staining, they're hard to see. That's why some doctors say you shouldn't do most for melanoma, which I'll talk on because you can't see them. But these markers have that you could do in a, in a, in a Mohs lab have eliminated that obstacle. So you can see these cancer cells 
and you can't tell when it starts and when it ends. I mean, this has the, you know, you know which one's the melanoma, but as my mentor, John Zatelli, who's one of the pioneers in this field, used to say, a monkey looking at this could be able to tell, which is, you know, wh you know what's a melanoma, what's not, because a skin cancer, as we talked about earlier, just is, is very, like, pervasive. Their cells don't stop dividing, and that's what you see here, and this is normal skin. So it's not as difficult and as a lot of people think it is, although it can be, but this one is not. All right, um, so most surgery for melanoma. This is one of those topics, if you ask 10 dermatologists, some are going to be very for it, and some are going to be very <coughs> against it. Um, and a lot of it is not based on data, it's just based on dogma. I was trained that you shouldn't do most for melanoma. Well, why? Because you can't see it. The, those immunostains for melanoma is called Mark 1. Eliminate that obstacle. Um, if you take less, it's more likely to recur. Well, there's data to show that that's not the case. The, the five-year disease-specific survi survival for melanomas treated with Mohs versus excision is the same, if not better. Um, it has not made it into the, the guidelines, the NCCN guidelines, um, which are out there, except for one subtype of melanoma that affects the head and neck called lentigo maligna. Um, and another issue why it hasn't taken off besides the data that's there and besides the, the prospective trial that's, that's um, going to come out and proving its efficacy, there's not that many people that are trained to do most for melanoma. Um, because of the medical legal arena involving melanoma, a lot of doctors, well-trained doctors, shy away from anything that is not in that standard of care because they feel that if anything happens, they're gonna be liable. But this is one of those things that unless you're using data to advance medicine, you're not gonna come up with better treatments and, and data is needed and, and that's how medicine works. And that's why uh, there's about 15 or 16 centers, including ours, which are doing this prospective trial. And that's what you need for, for data. You need five-year follow-up data to see if um, it, it, um, it's as effective as, as we think it is. And then what's involved in, with most surgery? You do need an additional one to two years of training after dermatology, and in dermatology, what's unique, you learn not only the dermatology and, and the diagnosis, you learn pathology, and that's what you need to do to do most <coughs> surgery. Uh, but to become a most surgeon, you need to do a fellowship. That said, not all dermatologists who do most surgery have done that fellowship. So again, consumers are, are often a, you know, in, a, in a hard bind to find a doctor because the group of doctors that haven't done the fellowship, they've created this organization that sounds very legitimate, and, it, and you know, in their mind it is, but it's one that uh, trains doctors in a weekend course in San Diego to become a most surgeon. Is it illegal? No. Um, in medicine, if I am a, let's say, internal medicine doctor, is it illegal for me to treat a patient that has, um, I don't know, a skin cancer? No. Um, are you gonna get a lot of referrals? No. So, yeah. So any doctor could do neurosurgery, but most hospitals aren't gonna allow you to do neurosurgery. So consumers really have to read between the lines and ask for training. Um, and I have a link to the website here that provides more information on that. All right. So what are some other treatments that, uh, that are out there for skin cancer? There was a drug FDA approved back in 2012 um, that we're just gaining some experience with. Um, it's called Vismodigib. Um, it is for basal cell skin cancers that are very advanced. Um, what we've learned and what the data showed that it's not curative, it's more palliative. So it's recommended for advanced basal cells that are not surgery, surgically resectable and surgically resectable, there's no definition of it. It's if a doctor looks at it and says, hey, I can remove this, or one can say, you know what, I don't want to deal with this. So that's you know, one of the issues with which patients this is good for. But there are patients very rarely that develop metastatic basal cell skin cancer. Um, these are lesions that have grown for decades, have invaded bone, and, and eventually um, metastasized. Um, and this drug shrinks the size of it. Um, there's a lot of side effects, so patients often can't stay on it, and when they stop, they, um, they rebound. 
but it's a step in the right direction. This was the first of its kind um, with the mechanism of action and this indication for, for a skin cancer. <clears throat> and then this is some data that came out recently for uh, sentinel node biopsy. So if you have a melanoma and it's invasive, it's recommended to get a sentinel node biopsy to see if it's gone to the lymph nodes. And the hope was that if you remove that lymph node and, and if it's positive and you remove all those nodes in that area, you would improve survival. The biggest data, uh, or the biggest study to, that was to look into that with long-term, like 10-year data, showed that it really doesn't improve survival. Um, why? Maybe because if it goes to a lymph node, there's nothing stopping it to go into the bloodstream, because the lymphatic system and the blood system, the vascular system, are interconnected. So just because it's in the lymph node doesn't mean it hasn't already gone elsewhere. So removing those lymph nodes doesn't necessarily improve survival. Uh, they still die around the same time, but it is used for staging purposes, um, for, for drug treatments. Um, even then, I touched on this earlier, a lot of the drug treatments for melanoma that you hear about, for advanced melanoma, they improve the lifespan not by many years or decades, it's usually months, um, but it's all we have. And if, if you're a patient that has melanoma, you want those months. <coughs> So as far as the future of uh, skin cancer treatment, gene expression profiling, GEP, it's starting to catch on. There's some data on it. Um, um, what it does is you take the tissue from the, the cancer, this, in this case melanoma, you send it to a lab. They look at a certain number of genes that are known to have highly aggressive um, indicators of highly aggressive behavior. And then they stratify your melanoma if, if it's a low risk or a high risk melanoma. So it tells you the likelihood of you having a metastasis in the future versus not having one. And um, it's not, again, mainstream, but the hope is, or at least my hope is, it'll replace a lot of the invasive staging purposes that we do. Um, this is being used a lot in different cancers too. And, for some cancers, you have to have certain mutations to get certain drugs. So this is this is the future. This is what's going to be making headlines um, as new drugs come out that are indicated only for patients that have certain mutations. All right. So we talked about the skin cancer, the statistics, epidemiology. We touched on the <coughs> update, what's new in, in, in the treatment of skin cancers. Well, prevention. Very recently, there's been some new... Uh, new guidelines and, and uh, new laws that have been signed. So let's start with the, the labeling guidelines that the FDA released back in uh, June of 2012. Um, it didn't enforce it until um, about 6 to 12 months after that. It basically set the standards for labeling of sunscreen so consumers could have um, a better idea what they're choosing and if it's really effective. So what are some of those guidelines? The term broad spectrum can only be used if a sunscreen blocks UVA and UVB and it's SPF 15 or higher because we know both UVA and UVB play a role in skin cancer. If it's less than SPF 15, which means that it provides um, not adequate um, UV protection, it has to have a warning label just like cigarettes and, and does al alcohol doesn't have a warning label, does it? No, it does. Yeah. Yes, okay. Not on the wine bottle. You're not a pregnant yeah, woman. Yeah. No, maybe I. I mean, it's pregnant. Pregnant. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I look, yeah. <laughs> so that 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 warning label now says skin cancer slash skin aging alert. Uh, spending time in the sun increases your risk for skin cancer and early skin aging. This product has been shown only to help prevent sunburn not skin cancer or early skin aging. So they basically want consumers to know that if they're using a low SPF, they're not getting the protection that they need to prevent the aging process that's related to sun damage and skin cancer. They also ban certain terms unless the manufacturers were able to come up with data to prove them. Those terms are waterproof. There's no such thing. Water resistant, yes, and, and the last bullet there shows that if you want to put the label water resistant, you have to have standardized testing and show if it's you know 40 minutes versus 80 minutes um, of water resistance based on those standardized testing. Sweat proof you can't allow. Sunblock because there's no real sunblock. It just um, 
it doesn't nothing really blocks the sun completely. Not even zinc oxide. It's closer to a sunblock, but not completely. No, no. Instant protection and also SPF 50 or higher because again, they need data. They they want to see data to show that SPF 50 or higher does what it's supposed to do. Um, and tanning and skin cancer. So we know more people develop skin cancer because of tanning than develop lung cancer because of smoking. So our public awareness when it comes to skin cancer and tanning be it in the sun or in the tanning bed is where we were about 30 years ago or 40 years ago with tobacco smoking and, and, and the public awareness of it. So we go the long, we've come a long way but there's still a long way to go. It took decades for cigarettes to be have the warning label and that awareness to be there for it not to be used in movies as, as props you know as, or as promotional uh, material and it's estimated that about 400,000 cases of skin cancer in the US are linked to indoor tanning and those are the numbers we're seeing the youngest patient I've seen in my practice with a sun related skin cancer like a basal cell is 19 so we do see young patients, and she was a tanner for many years in her teenagers. Put that along with fair skin, the genetic makeup, and, and, and the predisposition to it, you're really getting these cancers earlier. And sustaining five or more sunburns in your youth increases the lifetime risk of melanoma by 80%. There's a lot of statistics like this, and they're all based on data. So every piece of data shows that, yes, sunburns do increase your risk for melanoma and other skin cancers. And this is another new regulation. As of September uh, of, of this year, tanning beds have to be classified as a class 2 device in the eyes of the FDA. A class 1 device is a band-aid, is a tongue depressor. That's what tanning beds were classified as. So now they're classified as a moderate to high risk device because of their known carcinogenic effect. And I touched on the, the WHO recognizing UV radiation as a known carcinogen. And this is the most recent development as of last month. Uh, President Obama signed the, the Sunscreen Innovations Act, uh, which basically allows the FDA to prioritize and approve more effective sunscreens that have been on the market um, in different in overseas for over five years and the two big changes are it requires an eight-month deadline for the FDA to make a decision prior to this the FDA would take years and never act on any of these new you know ingredients for a number of reasons um, and the FDA no longer needs to issue a regulation in order to approve an ingredient so they could approve something based on data uh, but without having to issue a formal regulation. Um, it basically allows more options for consumers. Um, in Europe, there's a lot better sunscreens that are more effective. Um, soon you'll see them working their way into their, into their pharmacy shelves. And a lot of those sunscreens are longer active. One of the issues we have now is most sunscreens don't last that long. So you put it on, you're supposed to reapply every two to three hours. And honestly, most people do it. I forget to do it myself, so, and I know these. So um, the longer lasting protection definitely will help. So that was the last piece of information I had as far as update on the prevention. Um, this is just the outline of what we talked about. We talked about the stats, the causes, and the treatments in an in a overview sense, and some of the updates when it comes to the statistics, the treatments, be it surgical, the mainstream, and its updates. Uh, new drugs that are out and um, and preventions and I think my email is down here if, if any of you guys want to reach me in the future I'll be glad to help <coughs> So that's so medicine as a as a general field is very conservative. Change in the way things have been done, it comes very slow. Just to give you some background, back in the early 1900s, if you had a melanoma on your arm, late 1800s, 1900s, they would amputate the whole arm. And it took 
decades for that to change despite a growing body of evidence. So it went from amputation to five centimeters to three centimeters. These are the margins of normal skin that are recommended to be cut when you remove a melanoma. Down to now it's basically one and two centimeters. So one of the concerns is with most because you're taking less skin because you're checking everything, you don't have to take as much, you're gonna miss something. But again, if that was the case, the data would, would, would support that, and it hasn't. One of the arguments is you can't see the, the melanocytes, the melanoma cells, with standard tissue staining. That's true, it's hard to see, it's not impossible, it's hard. But those immunostains, the immunoperoxidase, the IHC, have eliminated that concern. Um, so there's a lot of dogmatic and historical, well, this is not how we did it. So it's based on that, the criticism is not based on the data and the literature that's out there because the data and literature is there, it's supportive of it, but again, there's this resistance to adopt something that's different from how things have been done for a long time. But it's coming. Once you have like the, the gold standard of data, which is what we're working on, like prospective trial, <coughs> it's going to be hard to refute. You know? So for the melanoma, then, the standard football-shaped excision is is what's done, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if I was... Uh, uh, the 10% the there? Right. Well, yeah. No, it's, it's a concern. And, and it, they do recur, um, especially in heavily sun-damaged skin, because in heavily sun-damaged skin, you have so many freckles and sun damage that makes the margins of the actual lesion hard to, hard to see. Just before I came here, there was a melanoma on the back of a gentleman. There was a scab about a centimeter and a half above it, there was another lesion that looked somewhat suspicious. I biopsied that, did the IHC, and that also turned out to be a melanoma. If I would have done my one centimeter margin and angled it um, in a way that uh, that area wasn't included in there, he would have had to come back next week and I would have had to do the whole thing over again. So it eliminates that yeah, possibility. Yeah. I don't know if you could talk a little bit just about you know, when you're telling a patient what you think they might have or that they need to get something removed or whatever. The difference between like freaking people out, <laughs> you know, saying I think you have a possible melanoma versus like, it, how do you kind of go about that right. process? Um, that's a good question. And having been through family health issues, you know, a lot of doctors do freak patients out. So. This is, I'll give you my spiel as if you were a patient. So let's just say you come to me, you have a biopsy proven basal on your nose, and you're there for surgery, and you know, my nurses have talked to you, the schedulers, you bring the brochure. <coughs> After we do a handshake and I look at you and I, I tell you I have good news for you. You have a basal cell skin cancer, and the good news, it's the type that doesn't spread because basal cells, when they're small, they don't spread, they have to be really massive to spread. Um, your, your skin cancer is not the type to spread. When you remove it with the most technique, there's a 99% cure rate, and that my goals are to cure you and to keep your good looks. <laughs> that, that's my spiel, and I do this about eight times a day, yeah. You've got it memorized. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, and then let's say, um, it's all how you phrase it. I mean, what I'm saying is accurate. Am I focusing on that 1% or 2% recurrence rate? And no, I'm focusing on the 90, you know, the glass being half full. What if it's a melanoma patient? Oh, I was going to ask that. Yeah. You break the news to the one with right, the bad right. one. So let's say it's a melanoma patient. Their melanoma is very thin. The, the depth of melanoma, which is measured on the pathology report in Breslow's thickness, that's what it's labeled, it's in millimeters. So if they have one that's less than one millimeter, their chance of having dying from their disease in five years is very small. Let's say like nine, like 5% chance of dying, 5 to 8%. So they have a 93 to... Uh, 92 to 95 percent chance that they're not they're going to be fine so I tell them you have a melanoma the good news is it's very thin and I take out a ruler and I, and I show them what how thick a millimeter is and I show them how theirs is only a millimeter or a fraction of a millimeter and that they have a 93 to 95 percent chance of not having any issues with their melanoma long term so it's all how you phrase it I mean you could freak patients out but I don't see any benefit in that um, keep going though I mean, in terms of like seriousness, like what do you tell someone? If what do you it's mean? It's not looking good. What if it's not looking good? So, 
knock on wood, it's rare that I have patients that are that advanced. So the same gentleman that had a melanoma on his shoulder today that I treated three years ago, he had a melanoma that was very deep, like three point something, and it was missed, and we removed it, and it was the whole nose, and he needed a big reconstruction from a forehead. Um, no, I, 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 you know, I don't try to scare them. I'm like, you know, this melanoma is very thick. The chances of it coming back are, are high. So you have a 60% chance that it won't, but let's say you have a 40% chance that it will. And you need to do A, B, and C to make sure that, you know, um, if and when it comes back, we catch it early and, you know, you have as little negative sequela from it as possible. You mentioned that the, um, cutting, the rate to cut those in a, um, of finding about the kind of skin scars in African Americans and Latinos, usually they come when it's too late for them. Why? Because maybe there's the conception that we don't get skin cancer because of our skin color. Exactly. Or that's 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 the that's what we think, and there's some data looking at the why that's that's the case. But the belief that you can't get it or you don't get it or you're not at risk in you as a patient or a consumer, and that belief in the primary care providers. That, that treat those patients that say, you know what, you're dark skin, you're fine, don't worry about it. So even if he, a patient is an African American Latino come with a concern like, oh, I have this spot, they, maybe the provider could not dismiss the person because- Exactly, shouldn't, yeah, okay. yeah. Especially like, uh, unless you look at these things day in, day out, even if you do, you could sometimes miss things. Like, so for a primary care provider to say if, it's, if a lesion is skin cancer or not, it's hard unless it's a very classic benign lesion. Um, but otherwise, unless you have that training, it's, it's hard. So that's why I think it's, it's important to get a dermatologist to look at things when it comes to suspicious things or things that could be potentially skin cancer. Yes? What are some of your thoughts on, on mid-level providers in dermatology? I mean, I, I know I've talked to a lot of doctors yeah. in different areas and they have different philosophies on the usefulness of the mid-levels, but I didn't know if you had any thoughts on, on that in, in dermatology. Can you right. clarify for the group what you mean by mid-level? Well, uh, maybe like a physician assistant, uh, nurse practitioner. Right. So it's becoming more and more common for physicians, including dermatologists, to have a mid-level provider. Um, I don't have one myself, but a lot of my colleagues do. Um, just like any, just like doctors, I think there's some really good mid-level providers that have a good eye for things, um, and there's some not so good, and it's all based on training and, and, and skill sets. That said, I think mid-level providers are good for diagnosing the common things, like a basal cell is very common, the you know, squamous cell melt, the things that you know, they see often. But there's certain conditions, like I mentioned one, extra mammary Paget's disease that shows up in the groin and the axilla of older men and women. Looks like a rash. Um, those more uncommon things, I think, w are more likely to be missed because they haven't been exposed to it. You know, those rare things, I mean, when you go through dermatology training, it's, it's you know, internal medicine one year and then three years of dermatology. You may see it once or twice in your entire training. So if you haven't had that training and, yeah. Do you think there's a shortage of dermatologists or are more people just getting skin cancer? I think it's both. There's probably a shortage and more people are getting skin cancer and there's more awareness and the baby boomers are, you know, are are are, are developing these lesions and, and some are not all are skin cancers and they want them removed and yeah. Yeah. My wife does it, and, and I cringe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I read some articles on it, and they say you should put on sunblock, basically, while you're doing it in order to protect your skin. I'm just wondering if that's ample protection, or if we even know if that's ample protection. You know, we don't know. Um, and But at the same time, there's no data to show that those specific devices increase your chances for skin cancer. But if it's UV, you could presume that it does. So I think the, the advice of putting on sunscreen or just avoiding it. Avoiding it at all, yeah, completely. Or if you have to do it, <laughs> if you have to do it, God forbid, or I'm not a woman, so I can't. <laughs> um, but if you have to do it, um, 
yeah, just put on sunscreen or, or I don't know if there's gloves you could purchase with the, the tips. Yeah, cut off, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman in the back, he's raised a couple of hands, sorry. I've, I've talked to Kaiser in town and they are doing um, telemedicine screens where they're having a, a primary doc pull out a cell phone camera or some other kind of camera and take a, a shot of a suspicious spot and then email it off to the uh, referring uh, dermatologist for a quick look. Is that something that slides? Um, if access is an issue, it's better than nothing. Is it ideal? No. Um, and there is actually um, one of my attendings from Pittsburgh, he's started a company that does that. You could, patients could go on, send their pictures of their lesions and, and he outsources them to different dermatologists to look at and, and make a diagnosis. It's not ideal, but if, if there's a concern or issue with access and that patient would otherwise not see a dermatologist, it's better than nothing, yeah. What are some of the challenges of looking at a photograph? You know, it's, it's, let's say a basal cell skin cancer. Sometimes, you know, like just today I had a patient, very flat lesion, and unless you shine the light on it at different angles, you wouldn't see it because it reflects the light differently. So the concern is if that picture is taken and that you don't see that reflection of the light because of the angle of the image, you would say, oh, it's fine. The feel, you're missing the feel of the lesion, right? Because skin cancers like basal cells, if you touch them, you usually feel something. Even if it's flat, if there's something there, you feel a firmness in the skin. So you miss out on some of those. But again, it's, it's better than nothing, yeah. Um, a lot of the boards of medicine, I think Kaiser could do it because it's all within one entity, but I know one of my colleagues had tried to start something like that in Maryland, right across the DC line, and um, the Board of Medicine in Maryland wasn't having it, or they thought, yeah, there, there's there's some medical legal aspects of it too, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yes? What's the cure rate for <coughs> this mod, this mod giving? It doesn't really cure, it just shrinks, okay. it just shrinks, yeah. Um, I don't know if, if any one of those patients actually had like complete shrinkage, but again, it's, it's, it shrinks the tumor, um, but it doesn't cure it. What, what about Zelbarat or any of the combo treatments that are in clinical trials now? Right. I haven't seen the data for the, the combinations. They're more promising, um, but those are, those are on the, the new frontiers. But again, most of these are not used... Um, like so if you have a skin cancer, be it a melanoma or a baby, it's, you cut it out. That's the, you know the treatment of choice. Those are for patients that their disease has advanced and metastasized, and and there's really no other treatment option, and it improves their their. Well, with Vismoda give, they don't have data on, on survival because most patients it takes them many decades to die from a basal cell, uh, but for some of the other for melanoma, it does improve survival. Yes. The um, PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibitors and some of the other drugs, um, you, you know, you mentioned that so far they are not transforming survival, but do you think that they will eventually? I survive? think they will eventually, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the new hot, you know, family of drugs, the PD-1s, yeah. Um, they will eventually, but, and, and we're hopeful and optimistic. Um, um, and you know maybe it's it's a combination of of, of these drugs um, or new um, variations of it where they're more effective. Yeah. Time for one more question. I just uh, when you were mentioning about that SP SPD fifteen and lower, why they just stop making those instead of having a warning label? Right, right. No, I'm not sure. I don't know if the FDA can say don't make it because there's some consumers that want j only a little bit but you know yeah not to mention that somebody's still making money on those things yeah. Yeah. somebody's yeah. buying them so. it's like makeup they put four SPF oh it's sunscreen and right that has some potential on me <laughs> yeah. all right thank you so much sure I really appreciate your comments yeah.